and welcome to our weekly political show, Politics and Beyond. Jara Amade Shate Prothombarer Moto Jogdan Korlen, Tadej Jonno Bolchi, Amade Program to Hoche, all about politics and policies. And we basically talk about how <coughs> you can shape politics and politics can shape you. Amade Achke Amade Program, Amade Akjon MP Achen, Abong Amade Dujon activist among um, council candidate achen ami onader sathe apnader sathe porichoy kore debo ar apnara jara bigo uh, shobshomoy amader program dekhe thaken apnara janen je amader three segment er ekta program ebong amra uh, political opinion ebong dui ti aro um, uh, bishoy niye amra ei program e sadharonoto alap kore thaki um, ami amar onushthane jawar age amader je uh, bishishto um, uh, guest tader sathe ami apnader sathe porichoy kore dicchi আপনাদের অবগত জন্য জানাচ্ছি যে আজকে আমাদের প্রোগ্রামটা আমরা মোটামুটি ইংলিশে করে যাব কারণ আমাদের সাথে যিনি আছেন এমপি তিনি বাংলা বলতে পারেন না obviously তো সেজন্য আমরা ইংলিশে করব first of all i would like to introduce our first guest who has come all the way from bedford um, mr richard fuller mp how are you i'm well nice thanks, for, thanks, thanks for coming to oh, our it's show. my pleasure my know, pleasure thanks for having busy me man and uh, all the way from bedford you yeah. made your effort to to come and see us it's a great pleasure thank you আমাদের সাথে আরও আছেন সুহি দর্শক মণ্ডলী বেডফোর্ডের বিশিষ্ট ব্যক্তি এবং অলসো দি ক্যান্ডিডেট ফর দি নেক্সট ইলেকশন ইন দি লোকাল কাউন্সিল ইলেকশন আমাদের শিশ ভাই শিশ ভাই হাও ইউ নট টু ব্যাড থ্যাংক ইউ থ্যাঙ্কস ফর কামিং আই নো ইউ হ্যাভ কাম অল দ্য ওয়ে ফ্রম বেডফোর্ড এন্ড বিসাইজ দ্যাট ইউ গো ইলেকশন কামিং আপ উইথ ইয়োর ক্যাম্পেইন এন্ড এভরিথিং সো আই রিয়েলি অ্যাপ্রিশিয়েট গিভিং আস দ্য টাইম থ্যাংক ইউ and আমাদের সাথে আরো আছেন বিশিষ্ট ব্যবসায়ী বেডফোর্ডের আমাদের আব্দুল বাসিদ ভাই বাসিদ মিয়া থ্যাংক ইউ ফর কামিং আই নো ইউর বিজি বিজনেসম্যান অ্যান্ড থ্যাংক ইউ ফর কামিং অ্যালং উইথ দ্যাম থ্যাংক ইউ রিয়েলি অ্যাপ্রিশিয়েট থ্যাংক ইউ দর্শক মণ্ডলী আমাদের মেইন টপিকে যাওয়ার আগে আমি আমাদের আজকের গত সপ্তাহের যে কুইজ সেটা ড্র করব এবং আজ এই সপ্তাহের কুইজটা আমি ইন্ট্রোডিউস করব গত সপ্তাহের কুইজ ছিল হু ইজ দ্য কারেন্ট হেড অফ স্টেট ইন বাংলাদেশ ওয়াজ ইথ খালেদা জিয়া শেখ হাসিনা ও রোশন এরশাদ অ্যান্ড অবভিয়াসলি মোস্ট অফ ইউ নো দি আনসার ইজ শেখ হাসিনা অ্যান্ড আই উড লাইক রিচার্ড টু ড্র দ্য উইনার থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ দেয়ার ইজ ইয়েস ভেরি গুড And the winner is uh, Salim Uddin from Manchester. Okay, all right. Salim Uddin from Manchester. Salim Bhai, we will um, send your gift to you very soon. Our next chapter is a quiz. We will see you on the screen, on the screen, at the bottom of the screen. The quiz for next week is, where did Bedford get its name from? One, Saxon chief, two, a Ford, three, both, or for none. So, we will send you an email address at pnb.channelieurope.tv. At pnb at channelieurope .tv. Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to go straight into the uh, first segment. And um, this is where we ask a politician about a political opinion that they would like to share with us. And um, as we have a uh, distinguished guest, our MP from Bedford, I'll ask him. What would you like to share with us um, that something has caught your mind and yeah. you know, grab your attention that you would like to share with us? I tell you, Ahmed, the, uh, the thing that sort of caught my attention, um, I don't know if it's really a political issue, but it's, it's, it's the plight of the three girls right. um, who uh, apparently have gone to, uh, to Syria and, and about how the family uh, must be feeling because uh, the three girls, Khadija, Amira and Shamima, you know they've left behind their their parents mm. uh, their siblings and their aunties and it's a real tragedy for for the family mm. um and it raises big questions about what support there is uh to enable families when they think that their <coughs> children might be subject to this luring online uh mm. to to go overseas what what support is there for for families you know i feel it, I, i just feel in my heart it must be just such a, a terrible time 
mm. for, for the family. And as a politician, you know, trying to work out what's the best way that we could uh, provide support, I think, mm. and that's a really big, uh, big question for me. I think for anyone who's a parent who has a, a young daughter, the, the people who are doing this, you know, they are predators. Uh, they're preying on, on our, our, our children, mm. uh, trying to say that there is something attractive uh, and luring them uh, overseas. And if this was for any other cause, people would be, and we are, we, we are horrified uh, that this can go on. And what should the, the response be from, know, from it, government? Is, it, is, it is a tragic. I mean, they are still considered as children because they're under 18. Oh, no. yeah. And um, like any other, any other crime, like you know, sex crime or abuse or whatever it is, this can also be considered as a crime where a child is being lured into. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you're, you're in the government um, and your party is the, yes. major, <coughs> excuse me, is the, is the major group. What, what do you think that the government can do to prevent this? Or is there anything that they're trying to do? Or yeah, we, we, we've recently just passed uh, a change to the law. It was agreed by actually all the, all the political parties okay. agreed it. And it had some, some sharp pieces in it um, about taking away passports. Uh, for people looking to travel, where there was a thought that they may be traveling uh, to uh, support ISIS or other terrorist uh, organizations. And equal as controversial, people have already gone abroad, uh, taking away temporarily their right to come, to come back. Mm -hmm. Now, I supported that. Not, not, I, I, I believe very much in civil liberties and all that. But I wanted to empower parents who thought their children might be susceptible to these, these online predators. Mm. Uh, I want to empower the parents to have that conversation so they could say to their children, you know, don't get involved in that. It's not right, and, and we'll lose you, and you won't be able to come, to come back. Mm. And I think this law is part of a package of trying to do it. I, you know, I, you know, Abdul, you, you've got a young, a young daughter. How would yeah. you feel about, about devastated, Susan? Devastated. I mean, uh, I don't know how, what I'd do if my daughter was in that position, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's about education. Um, we need, uh, we as parents, we need to know what's going on in their minds, um, especially with uh, tablets, phones, and that kind of thing. The information they have is vast. So, so as a parent, do you think that it's it's more of a more of a government's duty, the politicians' duty, or is it the parents' duty? I think both. So I think parents have a vital role. I think parents do have a vital role in actually yeah. um, doing that. But obviously, the, the the politicians can lay down laws and and and. Mm and statutes, you know, to actually cover that. I mean, uh, in initially, when the girls left, they, they said that, you know, the, the father was saying that the daughter said she's going to come back within an hour by midday prayer, mm. by Asr, mm. but it didn't. So, you know, as a parent, if it was me, I would say, well, it's, it's now 2 o'clock. Why Where she's is my not, daughter? You know, yeah, exactly, yeah. Because by the time they would have gone to the airport, it would have been about two hours, exactly. and you should have you know, raise the yeah, exactly. alarm yeah. on that straight yeah. away. If you have, if you have sort of instincts to say that. Yeah, you know. yeah. But they, the parents didn't though. No. They, you know, that's that's where the problem was. The initial stage, they didn't take. But Shishbai, as a as a local politician, do you think that this is a issue in in Bedford? Well, at the moment, it's not a big issue, but it will be. And um, I think, as Abdul said, the parents should be um, more alert to what's happening and what's going on. And, Maybe educated, maybe um, with government leaflets or whatever, you know, whatever mm -hmm. to, to, to tell people what to do and what to look out for. Mm -hmm. the, you know, um, if there's something, you know, not right, to actually contact the local authority or police and seek advice. Mm -hmm. Maybe have a, a helpline where people can ring up and ask for advice. Sure. I mean, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll come to come to the uh, the local issue a bit 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 later on. Shri Darshan Wingli, Apra Jara, the Onushanti Dekchen, just to let you know that we're at the moment talking about political opinion and that is about the three girls going over to Syria. Um, if you have any opinion or a question, do call us. Um, the number is on the screen and um, the guest will be happy to answer those questions. Uh, Richard, I mean, you talked about taking the passports and, and, and mm. things like that. But then again, if you take somebody's passport, they might not be going to Syria, uh, but they might be going to just on a holiday. So how do you kind of, you know, distinguish that? And yeah. on the other fact that you said that when they come back to take away their, their citizenship, yeah. but if somebody is actually born in this country and not an overseas, not born from overseas, yeah. then the government and this country has a duty to, 
to keep that person? You're, you're at, these are really tough questions, yeah. and you can imagine we had a, a big debate in Parliament yeah. uh, about them. And I was just walking down, uh, I was just uh, walking in, in, down Mill Street in Bedford last week, and uh, a guy said to me, so are you going to take away my passport? Yeah. And that's not what, what's going to happen. That's not what it's about. It's not about taking away people's passports. Yeah. There has to be a very clear understanding that's come from uh, the security services or those who know that this is about to happen um, before any measures can be taken. Yeah. And in Parliament, what was also agreed was for people coming back, um, it could only happen when there had been approval from the courts. So there is not just the government can at a whim say, well, we don't want you to come back. Mm -hmm. There has to be a case, has to be a strong case. The minister's got to say they want to do it. And then the courts have got to say, that's OK, you mm. can do it. So this is for a very, very small number of cases where there is concern mm. that people may be going overseas to involve themselves in terrorist, uh, terrorist activities. The UK, in doing this, is following the lead of the United Nations. Mm. The United Nations are worried that many other countries this is happening. You know, the number of people going from other countries in North Africa and across Europe and other parts of the world. So the UN as a whole has said they want countries to take this a lot more seriously. Mm. Um, they do see. That, uh, that vulnerable young adults and children mm. can be lured into doing this. Mm. They find their passport, and as you were saying, you know, you, don't, you can't track your son or your daughter every two hours. It's really hard to do that. Mm. But in that time, you know, they can decide, let's go and do this, may have sorted things out with their friends, and they're gone. So I think at that stage, parents have a right to say, government, what are you doing to help us? We, we want to make sure our children are safe and protected, <coughs> but we need you to be able to give us the tools so that we know if something goes wrong that, that our children aren't going to be led, mm. led astray. So the government's trying to do part of that. One, one, of the, one of the uh, girls actually went on a false passport. Mm. Uh, so even if, 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 if they would have taken away the passport from her, she was still going on somebody else's passport. And that was, it's a, it's a gobsmacker, isn't it? Um, before I bring in uh, Shishbai and, and Basibai, the other thing that I wanted to tweak out yeah. is, is that, um, I mean, what is it, you know, somebody that's, that's born here, raised here in this community and going around, you know, if, if I talk about East London, they going around Oxford Circus mm -hmm. and Westfield. Mm -hmm. There is no Oxford Circus and Westfield down Syria and where they're going to no. fight for. But what is it that they're offering that we as a nation can't offer that to, to these girls that they're going into. I mean, that's something to think about, isn't it? It, it is. Um, I would say that look at the people who are attracted. It is a, a very impressionable age. All of us, we're all, we've gone through our teenage yeah. years. Yeah. You know, it's a difficult time. You're dealing with uh, lots of issues changing in your body, uh, lots yeah. of things that are yeah. happening to you. And simple messages uh, put into an attractive packaging even if they are uh, devastatingly horrific, mm. can be attractive. They can lure people at that, at that time. I mean, this is a different... I mean, a lot of teenage boys love playing online games where they blow people to bits. Yeah. You know, that isn't what you want to see happening in the yeah. street. So I think you can, you can package something. And what, and what ISIS have proven themselves able to do mm. is, is manipulate a religion, mm. pretend that this is going to be something that is fantastic, mm. and lure children to go into a country, away from their parents, away from their families. Just think right now about the family of these three girls, mm. the families, how devastated they must mm. be about this. And, and we as politics, you know, politics sometimes is about doing the hard thing, but you've got to have a heart. Mm. You've got to have a heart for the mum and dad mm. of children in these situations. You've got to do that. And, and you know, there is no excuse whatsoever mm. for the predators of ISIS luring our children away. Mm. They are evil people. And we need to do as much as we can to banish them uh, from having any influence in our country, any influence on the next generation of Britons. And Basidbe, you talked about, sorry, you talked about um, as, as a parent that you would be <coughs> devastated to, to see your daughter going. I mean, I've got a 15-year-old or two, and, mm -hmm. and I'll be in the same position too. But what can, besides the government, what can we do to prevent that? I mean. We know for sure that it's all been happening through internet course, and yeah. from laptops and computers. Access, access to the so, internet. do you think that we should we should start checking more regularly on our, on our, so. on our kids? And I think so. Because at the moment, they have those things like parental 
stoppage and this and that. Yeah. So go back and look on those that if they've been manipulated or, or things like yeah, that. Yeah, some of those sites get past those parental controls, yeah. you know. So I think uh, it's a case of we as parents, we should be able to check these phones, check these tablets, mm -hmm. see what sites have been on, you know, to actually, mm -hmm. to actually monitor that, you know. Mm -hmm. And if it is something that we think right, mm -hmm. we should uh, educate our children, you mm -hmm. know, this is not right. Shush uh, in, in I mean, if you do become a counsellor, do you think that there's something that you can do on this matter to prevent, i.e. leaflets, that how to prevent kids from going into internet and checking and things like that? Do you think that this well, will be something that your council will take on? Oh, well, yes. I mean, it should be definitely done. I mean, on the way today, me and Basitba were talking regarding tablets and phones and how to um, keep an eye on them. Is this more to educate yeah. the parents? Um, yeah, and Basit Bai just came up, in, well, he, he's got it enforced in his house. He's got I the same know. password for all these kids, same, you know, um, access codes and whatever to actually check. So whenever he wants, he said, I want access to it whenever I want. Mm. So I think that's a, that's a, that's a great um, model to actually follow. Because um, whenever he wants, he can go to the, open the tablet and see mm. what's on Is that the end of the you're the one who's paying for exactly. it? <laughs> yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, um, yeah. yes, I mean, if I do become successful, I do become a counsellor, um, of course, yes, working with the council, yes, we'll be thinking of producing leaflets and uh, maybe educating the local communities on how to actually operate these tablets and open them up and see, you know, what to look for and mm. flag, flag things up. I think we as a second generation <coughs> parents, we, we know how to use tablets, we know how to use, you know, so it's, I think it's kind of easier for us, mm. easier, you know, whereas mm. our parents maybe didn't have that, you know, um, sort of mm. education to actually do that. Mm. You know. And councils do have a very big role to play in this. The prevent strategy, which mm. has been changed, and Autos now we're looking again to see how <laughs> that, can, that can be changed. We will rely on councils to take the lead on that in their local communities. And so that's why it's important in a town like Bedford that we have councils like Shish who mm. you know, are drawn from the community, who can understand uh, how messages can be communicated effectively um, and it's not just that we want one section of the community to look at this, we want all of us so, to look yeah, at this. This yeah. is about all of us. It could us. be anyone who's... It who's could be anyone. Anyone who's, who's victorious. Well, thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you, Shish Bhai and Basit Bhai. Shri Darshak Wondali, we've come to the end of our first segment. Uh, we're going to go on a short break, and do stay with us, and in a bit we'll come and see you again. Let's go on a short break now. Back to our show, Politics and Beyond. Jara on the Shate Matro Jog Dilen, I'm the Shate Tadjun Bulch on the Shate Achenaske Richard Fuller, uh, MP for uh, Bedford, and uh, Shishmia, um, council candidate for Castle Ward in Bedford, and a local businessman, Mr. Um, Bassett. Um, Basit Mia, is it? Abdul Basit, sorry. I keep on mixing it up. Sorry about that. Um, on this segment, uh, viewers, we're going to talk about uh, MPs. Um, as you know, at the early stage when David Cameron came to power, he wanted a fewer MPs and he put that to a vote, which he lost. And we still have the 650 members. Uh, his idea was to reduce it. And we will hear from Richard Y why that happened and, and what we can do, what they're going to do in the, in the near future. And also, there's a lot of talk about the uh, pay, the MPs pay, and it will go up in the near future, and we will also talk about that. So, Richard, to start off, MPs, mm. I mean, David Cameron, your leader, has said that he's going to have a reduced MP yeah. and uh, change of the boundaries. Yeah. And um, he put it to the to the house, mm. and he lost. What happened there? No, actually, he won. Did he? He did. Okay. So we had a vote. So I got my. Got no, my no. Well, I, I think you, you. I've got my information wrong. Then. No, no. Okay. The end of the story. You're right, but okay. the, the steps along the way are a little okay. bit. So you're absolutely right. Before the last, I became a, a member of parliament in 2010, 
Uh, but before that, there was a whole lot of scandal about MPs' expenses, uh, MPs' expenses about things. And so uh, when Mr. Cameron became Prime Minister, he said uh, two things. First of all, he wanted to uh, reduce the cost of politics. Um, so if you have fewer members of Parliament, there are fewer salaries, fewer staff, less cost. And the second thing that he wanted to do was make sure that all of the constituencies around the country had the same population, same number of voters, roughly the same. Uh, we're in a situation, we were in a situation where you have some uh, constituencies where there might be 40 or 50,000 voters and other constituencies where there are 95,000 voters. Now that's not fair. So that was the proposal and he put it to the House and of course we all said that's a good idea. So we passed that but then it all started to go a little bit wrong and all the politicians were thinking about their own interests, their own party interests. And ironically, it was in the House of Lords where nobody is elected. It was in the House of Lords that the Liberal Democrat members of the House of Lords and the Labour members of the House of Lords decided they would kill that bill. And it got voted down in the House of Lords and as a result, that hasn't happened. So we go into another set of elections with the same disparity, small constituencies and larger constituencies, and still with 650 uh, members of parliament. So do you think that uh, in, in the next election, this will be something in the, in the manifesto again? I hope, so. I hope so. I mean, first of all, I think you should only put in manifestos what you're going to do. Mm. Um, and, uh, and then you've got to really stick by it. Mm. Uh, the Liberal Democrats found out to their cost mm. that if you put something in your manifesto and you don't do it, it yeah. causes you all sorts of headaches. Sure. So I think the Prime Minister will think about it personally. I mm. think that's uh, the right thing to do. Mm. I, I think it is unfair where someone can say, well, my vote doesn't count as much as somebody else's mm. vote. So if, if, if I put it in a, in a straight, plain sentence, that it mainly got um, voted down in the, in the House of Lords because a certain group uh, felt that they might not win significant seats if the reform goes ahead and they might lose seats and the group will become smaller. Is that why you think that that has happened? Well, or something must have gone through their mind to not vote it through. Yeah, so, I mean, if, you, if you're sort of a, a political geek, yeah. right, um, and I'm not saying I am, but yeah. let's just say that I am. Yeah. This is a huge scandal. This is the first time in the United Kingdom we've had uh, what's called, you know, I would call, gerrymandering. This is where people manipulate the boundaries to their own party advantage. Uh, in some countries, the United States, for example, the politicians decide the boundaries. Mm. But we don't do that in this country. Mm. In this country, we allow the public servants yeah. to do that. And they do it, they listen to everyone, we put our points of view in, but they make a decision. Well, they had done that on the basis of cutting the number of MPs to mm. 600, mm. from 650, and on the basis of saying we have to get as equally sized constituencies as we can in terms of population. Mm. They'd done that. But then unelected Labour and Liberal Democrat peers, members of the House of Lords, said, no, we don't want that. It's not in our, mm. our favour. Mm. So I, yeah, I get very upset about it. I don't let expect me, let me to ask, decide. Let me ask Basit Bay on this. Basit Bay, you're a local businessman, taxpaying, hardworking, you know, a person, and also, also you're probably employing uh, a few people, and then subsequently they're supporting their family. How do you feel that when when these MPs they come and they say um, we're going to reduce this, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and then finally they don't? I mean, how do you feel about it? Well, it's promises that they're making, but they're not going to fulfil. You know. Now, obviously, if, if you're going to make a promise, then you need to fulfil it, you know. And um, I think th on this on this on this occasion, it was not much to do with the promise. It was the promise was fulfilled because, yeah. as I could understand, that it was Piers, put to the house. It was house, put yeah. to the, but a yeah. certain group of politicians decided that, you know, what would you say to to those politicians that has voted it down? Well. It's, they're probably getting paid for doing nothing, <laughs> you know, in my sense, kind of thing. Um, we work hard, we have to work for our money, so, you know, they should be looking at what the people want. Right, you know, okay. and, uh, and if, if But you would be in favour of a reduced government? Yeah, yeah, because okay. it would save money for the government. <laughs> Let me bring Shishbai in. Shishbai, in terms of um, your, um, as a council, do you think it's a good idea to reduce 
reduce well, the numbers and reduce the pay? Well, I believe not. You mean on a local level? Or yeah. As if you were a councillor, uh, would you accept a lower lower well, pay? Well, I mean, I believe um, the councillors at the moment are getting a bit, you know, too much. I, think I mean, sorry, we're, we are we're overlapping. I'm sorry. If you we're talking about the numbers oh, at okay, the moment. Numbers, we'll come to the I'll come okay. to the pay oh, in okay. a bit. But oh. the numbers. Let's say I don't know how many people you have, uh, how many councillors you have I think in your. Thirty-nine. Thirty-nine. Isn't it? Thirty-nine. So, do you think that idea. if you, on a, on a local level, that twenty-five can cover? Do you think well, that's a good idea? I, I believe, I mean, the more councillors there is locally, is better because they represent the local people, in in the local government. Okay. I believe the more. But if you have more, then you have more expense, isn't it? Well, so? that's what I was going to come on to. I okay. mean, I think um, the councillor should be on a reduced allowance. Right, okay. Because as, as a councillor, you should be working for the so local you, people. So you have a different on thought. It's like increase the numbers but reduce the pay. Yes, yes okay. definitely. Okay. He's got a different idea. Hmm? Reduce the numbers. Yeah. Uh, sorry, increase reduce the, the numbers and reduce the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> but I think his point, uh, Shish's point is right, which is at a very local level, yeah. um, councillors, you know, they're people who walk the streets and see the people mm -hmm. talk about improving the drains and the rubbish collections and making sure that the important things like schools are working well and and, and there is an argument to say that that on a very local basis it's good to have a large number of people actively involved in their local mm. community mm. but i think she's is also right that we've sort of professionalized mm. our local councillors by giving them more and more pay i mean you know, people in Bedford will be maybe, you know, maybe around the country. Sure, councils get a basic allowance maybe ten thousand, twelve thousand pounds, and then on top of that, they can double that by getting involved in certain committees. And, and you know, in, in Bedford, the the median income in Bedford is nineteen thousand pounds a year. That's someone going out working a full time job. The the middle person gets nineteen thousand pounds a year. Mm. And when <coughs> you think you're a councillor, you're doing your spare time, mm. and you're getting twenty, thirty thousand pounds a year. People say that's crazy. So I think Shish is onto onto something by saying that we should we should cut the allowance. And they've still got a full time job as well, probably. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah and that's yeah. on top of their full time yeah, job. Exactly. Mm. Uh, let's come on to the uh, pay. Oh, now you're on my pay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your pay. Okay. Uh, your, I mean, your the independent reviewing body has recommended 10% increase yeah. in, in yeah. MP salary. Yeah. How do you feel about that? I think it's ludicrous. A bit more in your pocket. No, I think it's as ludicrous. I would say. It, it, well, it is a bit more important, but it's, a, it's absolutely ludicrous. Richard, just hold on that thought. We've got a caller. Let's take that call. Hello, Salaam Alaikum, caller. Kay Wilton, Kutte Kay Wilton. Hello, welcome, Sam. Um, I would like to talk to Mr. Richard Filler. Sure, you're on air. You, you can speak to him. If you, put okay, down um, your, if, you, if you put down your TV volume, because we can hear the echo, and then you can speak to us, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, put it, put it all the way down and then speak to us on the phone. Okay. That's better. Okay. Um, so, hi, Mr. Fuller. Hello. Hi, Sorry. I would like to... Would you, would, you, would, you, would, you, would you state your name, please? Oh, it's Samir Hussain. Sorry? Samir Hussain. Samir Hussain. We can still hear ourselves on your phone. So, if you want to uh, mute your phone, TV, that will be best. Thank you. Can you hear? Is that the same? Yeah, I can, I can hear you clearly now. Okay. Well, yeah, I would basically um, like to just have my opinion um, on this show. Um, I would like it because the channel has been watched by communities and a lot of ladies that are at home, they need to be able to approach MPs and local councillors and use them and, and actually know why we have them in our community. Yeah. They need to be used um, as a bridge towards the government um, so that we can give our opinions, they will be able to explain things and make it common knowledge into the community. And we have Mr. I've got business with Bedford and Mr. Fuller comes in all the time and it makes things simple for us. He explains certain rules and regulations which when we watch the news, we don't really understand. Mm. Um, so it's very important that we have people like Mr. Fuller in Bedford that reaches out to the community and explains things in normal terms. Mm. And all the things that we're discussing today, all well and good, 
And how does that make any difference to the common person? Mm. How does that make any difference to the women and the girls that are at home? Or the men or the little boys? We need to be able to have common ground with these local councillors and with the mayor that is sitting there today that we're able to approach them. Yeah. Okay. Because we can't approach them. So, so you, 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 want a, uh, you want an elected member who is more approachable, is that what you're saying? Oh, definitely. Okay. And, and do you find Richard do you do you find Richard approachable? Oh, most definitely. I've known him since 2010, and he has done a wonderful job of um, trying to bridge that gap. Okay. And he's very approachable, and you could speak to him on any level. And if you want to have any problems or you want anything explained or anything of those sorts, you'll be able to do that in the um, on a very normal level, he doesn't. He's very approachable in that sense. Okay. Well, well. Thank you very much, Shamima. Thank mm -hmm. you for coming on 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 the um, on the line. Well, it's very well, supportive of you. you well, that's very nice. A business but, businesswoman, local businesswoman, yeah, calling it, and it's very nice. But Samira also, she, she put a finger on. I think what most people in this election are going to be wanting about. It's so easy to, for people to feel disaffected, disconnected with politicians. Yeah. You know, it's been a tough few years for people yeah. since the recession. Especially That's now yeah. seven or eight years. It's been a grind for people. Mm. People want to know that they can give a better future for their children and for their grandchildren. That's mm. been harder to see. It's getting a bit easier now. Mm. But it's been a long time. So it's easy for people to feel like, oh, you're all the same. You don't do anything. But Samira is absolutely right. If you want to influence things, you've got to have people locally who you can approach, whether it's a council like uh, Shish or an MP, who will take the time to listen, but also importantly, has the courage to stand up to power. Mm. The reason why we have democracy isn't so that people go around and earn big salaries and say how important they are. Mm -hmm. It's so they can speak truth to power. Mm. And if we have members of parliament or councillors who bring experience from running a small business or from being involved in healthcare in our hospitals, they've been teachers or they've been scientists, but they keep that touch of humanity about them yeah. and that perspective that they are the servants of the people, then I think we can start to rebuild people's faith in democracy mm. and stand up to the big guys. So, well, talking about the bridging mm. uh, between the, the, the community and the parliament, mm. I mean, Samira is was nice to say that you've been helping her with mm. information and things like that. Um, I mean, how can the council do that. They're more local. They they're based locally. They don't have to come to all the way to London to Parliament. So how can they bridge that more efficiently? Well, I personally believe, which um, I don't see much um, in Bedford, is um, maybe councillors holding local surgeries um, and um, advertising, in fact, to all communities, not just I said all communities, saying that we're approachable. Come to us mm. if you need anything. We'll try and help. If not, we'll point you towards the right direction. Mm. Maybe to our local MP or you know local authorities you know council police so i think um that's how you know the councillors should act as in be more approachable and be open and say come to us i mean samira has said that she she was um she got a lot of help from from richard as a businessman do you think that uh, how important is it for for elected members either councillor or an mp to have for that an, engagement for an MP for a councillor, I think is very important. And uh, the other thing I think um, Samira the sister said that is that the um, connection. You know, some people can't probably talk to, you know, some councillors and some people. This is why we need to get people that are from our community into the council mm. to actually have that mm. connection, approachable uh, flexibility. Approachable. Exactly. Okay. You know. mm. That's uh, up to us, Richard. We're, we were talking about the, uh, yes. the, the pay. Yes. Um, and you asked me whether it was fair for MPs to get that's a, it, yeah. So every... if you can contribute yeah. that yeah. bit. No, because... it was a ludicrous idea. What a silly idea. And, uh, you know, it wasn't MPs deciding this. Uh, because of the problems in the last Parliament expenses, we set up an independent group to decide this. And they came through some very, very profound analysis and came up with utterly the wrong answer, which was giving MPs a pay rise. I sat on the committee that looked at the pension arrangements for all our public sector workers, mm -hmm. our firefighters, our police, our teachers, 
our local government offices. Mm -hmm. And in all of those arrangements, the, uh, there were reductions in their eligibility for pensions, mm -hmm. the time they could get their mm -hmm. pensions, the amount they had to ha contribute had to go up to their pensions. Did I give any of those? Did the committee agree? Did the, and it was both parties, again, it was the Conservatives and Labour agreed this. Mm. Did we give compensation in terms of increase in pay mm. for those changes in their pension arrangements? No, we didn't. Yeah. So why should MPs be treated differently? So there's this proposal to increase MPs' pay from 2015 mm. after the election. We haven't had it yet. Mm. It's after the election. And I would say this to all of your viewers. Uh, get involved in the elections. Ask your question about all those important issues about your hospital, about your schools, but also ask all of the candidates, if you're elected as an MP, will you take that pay rise or not? <laughs> ask them that question, because most people aren't getting it. So why should MPs? Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, to be, to be, to be fair on the other side of the argument, I mean, some of it, the, as you said, the pension and the perks has been reduced mm -hmm. on this on this reform, isn't it? Mm -hmm. As much as they're introducing the 10% increase, they're also they're reducing the pension, like you don't get the golden shake, you know, mm -hmm. after two terms you're mm -hmm. kind of brick on the block mm -hmm. and you, you still get some amount of money. You know, all those perks and things are, then, you know, we, we heard about the second homes, mm -hmm. the uh, allowances, you mm -hmm. know, all that has kind of dramatically been it has been gone yes so if you take everything away I'm just being the devil's advocate here that on the other side of the coin the <coughs> argument may be that you're taking everything away but you're giving 10% for that so you're taking 90% away <coughs> you're giving 10% for that do you think that balances out well maybe I'm more hard line than you on this um, you know as I said median pay in my constituency 19,000 pounds yeah MPs pay 66,000 yeah. pounds. If I want to say who has a pay rise, I want the people who are on 19,000 pounds yeah. to get a pay rise. Let's, let's have those arguments for people on low pay. Let's look at ways in which we can increase the minimum wage faster than inflation so that people don't have to worry about their weekly food budget. Yeah. That's something we should focus and worry about. Not MPs should they get paid more money because they've lost this. Well, that's, that's all rubbish. And uh, I really do feel quite strongly about this. I, I, I believe in a, that being a politician, you're a citizen politician. Mm -hmm. You should do as much about your ordinary day-to-day -day life. Live in your community. Be, as Samira was saying, mm -hmm. connect to your community. Mm -hmm. And for goodness sake, 66,000 pounds versus 19,000 pounds. Come on. Three times. Do you think that it's, it's a, uh, I mean, Richard seems to that, seems like that, you know, 66,000 is, is good enough salary. But in some places you can't even, buy a house uh, or get a mortgage for that kind of, forget about the 19,000 one. I mean, in the global economy, <coughs> it's still a low pay for an MP. Wouldn't you agree to that? Um, I don't know. I mean, what is, what is the... What are you, is the are you, are you would agree with, with Richard? Well, I, I, mean, I, I wholly agree with Richard because he's right. He's, re he's right because obviously we should be, I mean, the government or the authority should be concentrating more on people who are earning you know, a lot yes. of low wages, like, okay. as, as you said, who are on 19,000 and 60, is a big, big um, gap. gap, isn't there? So, and as you said, people can't get mortgages because people are on low salaries. I mean, if they were on, on a better salary, I'm sure the banks who, who do mean testing will be actually, you know, um, sure. thinking of offering them mortgages. Your situation is quite different because nobody pays you. You make yeah. your own salary, you isn't it? So, way, yeah. so yeah. how does that compare to... Uh, somebody getting, if he's a councillor, it would be like 10, 15,000, an MP, 66,000. So how would you differentiate or, or compare yourself to that? Compare myself. I mean, yeah, obviously I have to pay my way and, and, and sort of work for that and for myself. And your pay would constantly fluctuate, fluctuate isn't it? Fluctuate, exactly. It's not a set 19,000, it's not a set 66,000, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I agree with Richard. Um, MPs or councillors should not get as much, you know, but I've got to live with Richard, so... <laughs> <laughs> I guess the whole panel's agreeing with you. Um, yeah, I, I, look, there are, there are some serious... You, we are, I, I do have a fairly uh, strong point of view on yeah. that. There are counter-arguments. Uh, I think you've made them, them quite fairly. It's yeah. very difficult for politicians, uh, for MPs in particular, to make the case. Yeah. Uh, we've had, you know, this week issues about uh, outside earnings, different types of jobs that people do, as well as pay. Um, I think in the end, the answer has to be, if, if politicians are delivering a better future mm. for the communities they represent, those communities may 
be more lenient towards politicians. Yeah. Mm. We're starting to make that. We're starting to see improvements. We've got a high growth economy, we've got high levels of employment. Inflation's almost at a record low. We're starting to do that. But as I say, it's been a long haul to get to this point of view. Sure, sure. Richard, before we go on a break, we've just got one minute. I just wanted to uh, ask you one question, and that is uh, the MPs in the House of Commons and the Lords in the House of Lords, they're the lawmakers. Mm. So they are the ones who make the ultimate law. But you're saying that there's somebody else who's making the law on your pay. Mm. And being the lawmaker, you can't really do anything about mm. it. Mm. How does that work out? Ask Gordon Brown. The, law, he said the lawmaker well. has another person making laws for them. The Independent Review Board. <laughs> <laughs> well, on the other side, do you really want MPs determining their own pay? I mean, um, most MPs that I spoke to, they're, they're pretty much in agreement with you. So if, the, if, the, if it was left with them, they probably turn it down straight away, isn't it? So that would have been a good thing. Well, we were there, uh, and that system caused problems, uh, major problems in 2007, 8, and 9. Okay. Expenses, scandals, allowances, moat houses, duck houses. <laughs> I mean, they're just everything. I really don't think we need. We should go there. Okay. Uh, but it does so raise other happy consequences. With the system at the moment. No, I don't like the system like it is either. Okay. You yeah. know, I'm not. I don't think there's a bright answer here. I just okay. feel the public won't trust the politicians to set their own pay, and they're probably right right now. Well, thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you, Shishbay and Basit Bay. We're going to go on a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the constituency and the MP. Stay with us and we'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to our final and uh, third and final uh, segment of this evening. And uh, as you know, we're talking with um, Richard Fuller, MP from Bedford, and uh, a Shishmia uh, prospective candidate for the council in Bedford, Castle Ward, and local businessman, uh, Mr. Uh, Abdul Basit. And uh, before I go into my third segment, um, I'm going to remind you of our um, a quiz. I'll, I'll remind you of our quiz, and which is, where did Bedford get its name from? Number one, Saxon Chief. Number two, A. Ford. Number three, both, or number four, none. Do email your answer to our email address. It's coming up on the, on the bottom of the screen. And it is at pnb at channeleyeurope.tv. Before I go into the segment, we've got a, we've got a caller. So let's take the call and then we'll go into the rest of the program. Salaam alaikum caller. Kya bol chen? Kote ka bol chen? Salaam alaikum. Waalaikum salaam. Salaam alaikum. Ahmed bhai, can I speak to Richard, please? Richard is here. He's 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 listening to you. Yes. Hello, Richard. Hi. Hello. Hello, Jam. Are you here? Just speaking from South Shields. Yes. Hello, yes, he can hear. I you. can hear you. Yes, yeah, are you here from South Yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard, I like to know from Richard, which is our community growth in Belau. There's a lot of problem going on education, especially. There's a lot of changing coming uh, very shortly. I heard somebody told me my community, uh, especially who is in sixth form, they're not getting any more Bengali subjects. So can you advise uh, what's going on there, uh, saving education? So, sorry, is it, is it on the education you're talking about? Yeah, education, that's right. Okay, yeah. what, what is it? Bing, what happened to the Bengali? Can you, can you rephrase that? Bengali in, in, in sixth form, I heard. In sixth form, okay. Yeah, it's also always like Spanish, Bengali, right. whoever, Siva, that, that's not going to be happening anymore. Yeah. Right, okay, okay. Okay, well, thank you, Ali Bhai. We'll, we'll ask Richard on that. 
uh, Richard, what I understand from the caller is that uh, in the six forms, and I'm assuming it's A-levels, mm. that uh, the foreign language is yes. not going to be uh, accommodated as much as it was no, before. And no. so Bengali is one of the languages. No, Ali, Ali is right, and, yeah. um, and it is a change. Uh, so the people who set the exams, the examination boards, they look every year at the number of people who are taking the subjects, whether it's a particular language or it's a part of science or some other study, uh, for A level, and they make a decision, do they think enough people are taking this course to justify keeping an A level examination in it? And what's happened uh, over the last couple of years is that certain languages are now being looked at and people are saying, well, there aren't enough people taking this subject. Uh, so I've already had people in my constituency come uh, to me about the Polish A level. Uh, and now Ali's raising the Bengali uh, uh, A level, I think, yeah. uh, from, from, from the call. And what I'd say to Ali and to others, this is something I am alert to. I've already written to the minister about the Polish language A level, and I'll do the same thing about uh, Bengali A levels. It seems strange to me that uh, when we're looking to build a generation that can see the world as their oyster, the world as their future, mm. that we should be restricting mm. the opportunity for them to train in a language uh, that they can then use uh, in their future careers. So, Ali, I'll, I'll look into that and, uh, and, and see what so I can do. So it's interesting what you say, that, you know, so this is another reviewing board that looks yeah. into it, so it's nothing to do with the parliament or the MPs or, or ministers. Yes, yeah, so, so... They would recommend. Yeah, they recommend. So, okay. so we have certain examination boards yeah. around the country, and they yeah. set the GCSE exams, yeah. and they set the A-level exams, and they're responsible then for marking those exams. Uh, so they report to the Secretary of State for Education, so Nikki Morgan does have a role in this, and yeah. I know she's taken a particular interest uh, in the Bangladeshi community in the country. Yeah. Uh, so she'll be very interested to uh, to talk to me about the Bengali uh, A level. Okay. She can't direct the boards that they need to do it, but she can certainly raise more general questions about have you considered the impact that this will have if you okay. take it away. Just to just to clear my mind, that would she able to then stop it from delisting? I think she's going to have. I think she'll have quite a lot of influence. Yes. Influence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ali Bay, thank you, Upper College Journal, and I hope you've got your answer. Uh, Richard Kukshundar Havaita Uttar Dear Sanjay, it's, it's a matter of a reviewing board that reviews it and then recommends it and hopefully he's already raised the Polish uh, language and he will raise the Bengali language and he's assured that Nicky Morgan has taken a keen interest on Bengali language already. Um, Richard, we're going to go and talk about our segment now mm -hmm. and it's all about you and your constituency. Coming back to talking about you, uh, you as Mr. Richard Fuller, the man, um, what I've heard is that you have been a great advocate of, of democracy. And um, back in your youth, you've set up a platform for, for then ANC mm -hmm. of South Africa, which was at the time uh, pretty much for the West known as a, as a bad boys club. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually supported that, which then created Mandela. So what made you create that platform? Um, and you must have had a mountain to climb. No, well, well, thanks for raking that up. That was <laughs> a long time ago. Um, you know, I, I was about 17 when um, we had an election in 1979, and I got involved in elections. And I, I, I love democracy. I think it's, you know, as Winston Churchill says, not perfect, but it's a much better way of us resolving how we want to work together. Mm than you know, beating each other up or finding some other way of doing it. And so I got involved in politics at a young age and I got involved in the Conservative Party. Uh, but I was, it had this passionate interest um, that we should treat each of us the same, that everyone is my brother or my sister. Um, and I looked at the African National Congress at the time. It was fighting apartheid, a, a system in a country that said, because you are of a certain color, skin color, mm -hmm. you have less rights than someone else. And I just found that uh, profoundly uh, unjust. And I didn't really care what people thought about that organization. I knew that, uh, that its cause in that circumstance was right. Um, and as you're right, Nelson Mandela was in prison. He was part of the ANC. He was in prison in South Africa. And I did my level best to promote those uh, voices in the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom and the voices outside the Conservative Party, obviously, as well, who wanted to see change in South Africa. Can't say I got a good reaction from some of the Tory party leadership at the time for that. Um, but in the end, we, it was a successful change. But the, the principle that then stayed with me, and I spent most of my 
professional life before I became an MP outside the United Kingdom in different parts of the world, uh, that experience reinforced on me uh, that we really should treat each other the same. We should mm. treat each other as equals. And it doesn't matter, whenever there's an injustice, uh, whether it's a woman uh, suffering from a female mm. FGM uh, in maybe an African country, mm -hmm. or it's someone who's a flooding victim, uh, maybe in part of Bangladesh or another part of the world, that could be my brother. That could be my sister. Mm. And how am I going to react to them in those circumstances? And democracy is a way in which you can then use your influence to make changes. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, take, taking your experience, uh, what I can gather is that you know, having that voice, I mean, but these days politicians, they toe the party line. Mm. And they're like, OK, this is it. And you can't say anything more than that or whatnot. You know, be it a councillor level or a membership or or MP or cabinet member, and you have to toe that line. But it is, from, from what I hear, your experience, that it is very important to have that voice. And because people like you had that voice, somehow it had helped Mandela at the time to reach where he had reached. Or otherwise, he, I mean, there were a lot of other Richard Fullers that, that did that, and they did not mm. toe the party line. Mm. They did not, you know, right. stick to, to the agenda. Yeah, well, look, in Bedford, we had a, a prime example. Uh, the uh, Archbishop of, of Cape Town was uh, uh, Trevor Huddleston, and he came from our hometown. Mm. And, and uh, Mr. Mandela said that uh, the Archbishop was the strongest white voice against apartheid. And when Mr. Mandela became president, uh, he came to the United Kingdom, and he came to our hometown. Mm -hmm. The whole of the high street was filled with people, mm -hmm. uh, and he unveiled uh, a statue to, uh, to his friend, and that campaign against apartheid, Trevor Huddleston. Mm. So yes, it's lots of different voices that can have an impact. And we have an election coming up. People should participate in those elections, whether it's uh, participating as a candidate for local council or to ask questions of people who are standing. Mm. It's a great thing. I mean, I'm going to come back to uh, talk about the constituency and a bit more about you. But Shishbai, how important is it to have a either it's a single politician or a politician within the group or within the party, that to have that voice, you know, how important is it? It's very important. It's very important to actually um, represent the local people who voted you in, uh, either at a local level, council or parliamentary. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, it is. I mean, in, from your experience, uh, how, how difficult is it or how easy is it for you to maintain that? Is it, is it something that you're... You're passionate about you're maintaining it, or oh yes, or you're having hardship. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm sure you're lucky to have someone like Richard, oh, who's, yes, definitely. who's in the in the um, who's the MP. <laughs> because <laughs> if he's got that values, he certainly will support that. But in terms of the other uh, supports and networks, where, where do you think you you sit in with that voice element? Well, what it is, I mean, at the end of the day, people who are elected into power or you know um, certain um, authorities. Um, as human beings, we do make mistakes, but at the end of the day, it's working together with the local people, local community, mm -hmm. working together and ironing out all the creases and straightening things with the help of the local people. Mm -hmm. Because it is, it is, I think it's near enough impossible to do it solely. You've got to have help from people who have voted you in mm -hmm. and um, do it together. That's what I believe. From your experience as a, as a businessman, I mean, how, many, how often did you hear peop, you know, politicians coming to you and say, sorry, Basit, we can't, you know, this, you know, it's not possible to do it. And how many times did you hear people, a politician, say that, don't worry, we'll, 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 we'll voice this anyway? Yeah, I see what you mean. I mean, um, oh, I've got to say Richard, I mean, a uh, big supporter of business and, and, and local people in Bedford, and the support that he's given us, I mean, if every politician was like that, then it would be a different world, wouldn't it? You know. Mm. Generally. But Rich, Richard, um, coming back to, let's talk about your constituency. I mean, that's where all it matters, isn't it? It's the uh, best place in the world, mate. But that's where come it all up. matters. Oh, because we want you to come visit. Are you going to come visit? <laughs> yeah, sure, we will. Absolutely. We will, definitely. Um, I mean, what is, what is it that you've, what is the single biggest thing that you've done since you've, I mean, it, it's been a hard hard time this parliament yeah. of, with, the, with the with having no money the economy yeah. and this and that and that so what yeah. is the the worst scenario and how did you bounce back in your in your yeah. constituency so I, I, I got the chance to be uh, an MP having you know had a professional career beforehand um, and it's the town that I was born in so I had a feel for 
you know, what it needed. And it seemed to me that Bedford is its best when it's a family town. It's at its best where the schools deliver a very high standard of education so that children have the best start in life they possibly can. And when there's the availability of good local jobs so people don't have to travel far to get work. And in 2010, when I became an MP, uh, our schools were not performing particularly well. Uh, we had below national uh, average of wages, mm -hmm. and we had above national uh, rates of, of unemployment. So what I've tried to do is to focus on those things and be able to tell people, what have I practically achieved? So part of that was working with parents who wanted to set up their own schools, so the parents have a choice of which school is right for them. I think parents, when they get involved in the decision, yeah, exactly, when they get involved in the decision about which school is right, rather than just, well, they just got to go to that school, they go, mm -hmm. yeah, that's the school they have to go mm -hmm. to. It, it, when parents engage, they have a conversation about their children. Education is so important uh, for, for children. So we have in Bedford, other than London and Bradford, Bedford has more free schools, more new schools, more choice for parents than any other part of, of the country. We, uh, we do, and, and Abdul took part in this, we do a, an annual speed, I should call it speed dating, it's more speed <laughs> interviewing. Okay. We brought 60 local businesses together with 300 young people who were looking for work. Mm. And we gave them all a start, uh, three, at least three interviews. If you think of a young, young person and you're looking for work, mm. you write, you, you send off your CV and you ask for jobs and mm. you never hear anything back. Mm. We turned all that around and we said, give the person the interview first. Let that person shine across the table from an interviewer and maybe get the chance for some part-time work or maybe a full-time job or some work experience. Mm. And that's proved very popular with local employers and, and young people. So that's a practical thing. Mm. That we've done. And the third thing, uh, again, I'm, I'm going to uh, probably like this. I love entrepreneurship and small business. So we set up a business fund just for Bedford to invest in small businesses that are started in Bedford. And when you combine that with things like startup loans, which thousands of people, young people particularly, are taking advantage of, I want to make Bedford uh, a really great place for people to start businesses. And so we this, started on this that. fund that you're talking about is quite interesting. Is that's just local, local for local businesses, yeah. it, just for Bedford? Yeah. So it was, it was from. I, I feel in the community you have people who've done re relatively well. They have a responsibility for the rest of their community. So I asked some people who lived in Bedford, cared about it, put some money into a fund. We raised four hundred thousand pounds to help establish new businesses in our local community. So, so, so small business will apply to that fund yeah. and then they will yeah. receive X. How much are you paying in the top end and the lower end? Well, I'm not doing No, no, no. No, no, That's I mean, right. I mean what what is it's not an MP's thing. So uh, the, there's a separate board, there's a separate board okay. that deals with it. And, and they're looking to invest, I think, 50,000 pounds per business, maybe up to 60, 70,000 pounds per, okay. per business. And if you remember a few years ago, and even now, some, some people in, in small business, they find it very hard to get loans from a bank. Mm. So this is an alternative That's way of getting local move finance. To crowdfunding and exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. So these are practical things. MPs ought to do something. They shouldn't just spout off about things. They need to do things. Mm. You pay us a salary. What have we done? Mm. And uh, you know, hopefully, on those things about schools and education and jobs, and small business in Bedford, we're starting to have uh, some impact in getting the towns of Bedford and Kempston we represent uh, are moving. Basidai, did you benefit out of? <laughs> this this fund or have you applied or thinking of applying? No, no, but um, I do. Uh, now that you know of it, yeah. I do know a few of people that have applied for the fund, okay. and yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a pioneering uh, initiative in Bedford, and I think it has worked for a lot of um, young businesses or small businesses. Surely there's a criteria uh, based. There is, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. but there's a range. The other thing is there's a range of, of, of initiatives. If you think this has been the best time in the country to start your own, in the country's history to start your own business, mm. so you have startup loans and other schemes from the, the government, government to get has people involved. Few, absolutely, a few funds and supports at the same time, especially yeah. in the export zone. As yeah. far as I know, that you know, if you if you export, the government will give you a lot of money or, or reduce your tax and things like that, you know. Yeah. So it's good that you're doing it on a local level too at the same time. It, well, it's inspirational. You, you walk around town, you see people who started their own business. It's a huge risk that they take. And they take a risk for their own family's livelihood. And, you know, it can be at the end of a month, they decide, my goodness, I've got to pay my wages to my employees. Mm. How much have I got left for myself? And, you know, there are lots of families in Bedford. They run restaurants, they run taxi business, they do lots of different things. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, they deserve our praise. They are the people who create the wealth, yeah. that pay for our hospitals, pay for our schools, and, and employ people, enable them to have the security of a pay packet. And the fact that we're making it easier for people to do that in Bedford and around the country, 
that's got to be good for the economy. It's got to be one of the reasons why the economy nationally is growing so much more strongly than other countries in Europe. Mm. Shishbai, do you, do you agree with um, Richard that, you know, that the economy locally is growing much better than other places? Or? I believe better is thriving at the moment. We are going forward. Okay. The past time. It's very, you know, so do you think that your um, local council is part and parcel of that success? Um, <laughs> well, uh, that, that should <laughs> next. <laughs> um, well, I mean, because your your council is a yeah, hung council, hung isn't council it? They've got just. 12 members from each party. Each party and four independents. Four independents. Independence, independence, yeah. yeah. So, so. Um, and led by a directly elected mayor. Right? Okay. And and the mayor is doing well or? Next question, please. <laughs> you do. You do. You do. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> if you if you become a councillor, uh -huh. yeah, what what is the one most important thing that you would like to do to, to start off or either be it a campaign or something that you want to change within your within your ward? What would you like to Well the one main thing that's lacking in my you know, where I live, the ward I you know, the part of the ward that I live is representation in the council. The voice. I mean there's no voice for our end of the ward. Okay? okay. So what I believe is I mean getting together as a whole ward and having a voice on the okay. council. The that council. is, at, at the moment, it's not heard properly. You know, it's, it's not being heard properly. Okay. And plus, it's not just our ward. It's not just my ward. It's about working with the whole of Bedford, all the wards in Bedford, working mm. with all the other councillors and all the other people. So they're, at the moment, they're not spreading out. They're just clustered, is that's it? That's I mean, I have no idea of Bedford as much as you do, but mm. you know. So that's what I'm. So it's all about working together with everybody. Okay. Once you're in power, people have chosen you. You work together. Yes, you may have differences. Work it together and it represent the people who have voted you. Know, make the most of it. Richard, Shish wants to spread out the voice and work with everybody. Mm -hmm. What is one one single thing that you would like to do if you do become you, you come back as as an MP? We've got one minute left. So, so. in Bedford, um, the, one of the biggest issues is at Bedford Hospital making sure that it's secure for the long term. It's certainly going to stay here, but we have to secure it for the long term. My view is we need to get into an alliance with Adam Brooks Hospital, which is a very big hospital just outside Cambridge, incredible quality care. An alliance between Bedford Hospital and Adam Brooks will secure locally delivered services at the increasing care quality standards that we, we, we demand. That's not just me saying it, that's what our local doctors believe too, and I want to make sure we get that to happen. Okay. Well, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Shish Bhai. Thank you, Basit Bhai, for coming along. Shri Apre Shulin, Askar Bedford uh, uh, council, uh, Prospective Councillor and uh, Businessman and, and the MP who came here with the, to, to talk about the issues and what they will do in Bedford. I'm Ragamite, Arikjun MP Kenny Ashbo, I'm going to talk about Thakbin Ajum Bhai. I'm going to talk about Thakbin Ajum Bhai. I'm going to talk about Thakbin Ajum Bhai.